can't hear I can't hear Good evening, church. Good evening. God is good. And all the time, God is good. And as I would like to welcome you all here today, uh, this evening, as we are uh, heading to tonight's worship, we always start off with praise and worship. And what better way to start off with a fast song we have ever come. So I'd like, to, I'd like uh, I'll actually to get up off your feet, on your feet, and let's sing this song. If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. How many of us clapped our hands because we're genuine about being happy? How many of us? And not just because I told you to clap your hands. And I guess that goes on to, to our walk with Jesus, right? You know, you don't walk with Jesus just because the pastor told you to walk with Jesus, right? You walk with Jesus because you want to walk with Jesus deep down in your soul. Amen. Amen. Amen, Donnie. If you are happy to be here on day four, I want you to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are looking forward to hear the word of God from Pastor Rose, I want you to say amen. 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 And if you want to hear another breaking story from Samoa, I want to hear you say, tell the story. Tell the story. I'm very glad that you said that because I was watching the Samoan news this afternoon. And there was this breaking story that came up about the United Nations trying to encourage the South Pacific to form this army, okay, this army of elite soldiers from right across the Pacific, so Samoa, Tonga, the Cook Islands, you know, New Zealand was even there. So anyway, there was these uh, three soldiers that came and they enlisted in this army, the South Pacific Army, 
So there was one from New Zealand, one from Tonga, and one from Samoa. One from Samoa. That's a big feat. Yeah, yeah, That's that was he's built like you though. Built like you. Nice and big, nice and big and ready to run those fields. So anyway, the colonel had come, you know, this guy was rough as guts. This colonel. And he decided to test these rookies. He, he decided to test these these newbies, okay? So he, he he lines them up in a line and he says to the New Zealand guy, Hey, kia ora. Yeah, kia ora. He looked at the New Zealander guy and he goes, did you come here to die? And the New Zealand guy stepped forward, saluted and said, sir, yes, sir, I came here to die. And so he goes, good man, good man. And so he walks over to the Tongan guy. Any Tongans in the house? Yeah, hey, kalo fai. Way to go, Anthony. Welcome, brother. Okay, and he walks over to the Tongan fella and he goes to him, Did you come here to die? And the Tongan soldier stepped forward, saluted to the colonel and said, Sir, yes, sir, I came here to die. And so he goes, Good man, good man. Malo opito, malo opito. And then he moves over to the Samoan soldier and he looks at the Samoan soldier, nice and built like Don. And he goes to him, Sole. Did I just sound like Roland then? <laughs> and he goes, Sole, did you come here to die? And the Samoan soldier stepped forward, saluted to the colonel, and said, Sir, no, sir. And the colonel looked at him and he goes, What? And he goes, I come here yesterday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, just to follow up on that. We want to welcome all of you tonight, today for or tonight for, and uh, yeah, just a special welcome to our visitors. Hey, eh? you see a few visitors out here. We want to welcome you guys for joining us tonight, even if this is your first night. Yeah, just welcome, and um, yeah, special welcome again to our pastor, Pastor Roland, who's uh, you know about to share the word. But not only that, Pastor Brian and his beautiful wife Bo, and uh, I'm sure I've seen uh, Pastor Sofitu here. Yeah, we want to welcome you too, but also our parents. Welcome to our parents, and especially our youth. Amen. Yeah, who's ready for blessings? Okay, who's ready for a blessing? Yeah, everyone's still cold. Go, Josh. Just a couple of announcements. We do still have our prayer room at the back. We encourage everyone to visit it sometime. Over the next three days, we only have three more days, so we invite you to, you know, make your way. You can go before our service starts, or you're more than welcome to uh, visit after the services each night. Um, we also have light refreshments after our service, so again, don't rush home. You know, come mix and mingle in a fellowship physically with everyone else over next door. Okay, before we uh, get into the rest of our program... There was one lucky person that walked through the doors and was handed a Toblerone chocolate. If you have that Toblerone chocolate, I want to invite you to come to the stage. Okay, if you've got that chocolate, and obviously you've been here every night this week. Hey. Hey, oh, Mr. Tonga, come, come, come. Come, Anthony. Welcome, Anthony. How are you? That's the way. Have you enjoyed... Uh, Every night this week? Yeah, 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 100%. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Good stuff. All right, so this chocolate that you have in your hand, I really want to give it to you. I want you to have it. I want you to take it home to your mom or your, someone that will enjoy that chocolate. But there's a price that comes with it. Okay, so what you need to do is, because you've been here every night, I want you to just uh, give us the topics for every night this week. Okay? Even if it's not the topic, you can just tell us what it was about, eh? Good stuff. All right. Okay. Um, I, Sunday night, um, it was about the red pill. Yeah. Popo mai, popo mai. Monday night was about um, the blue pill. <laughs> Ah, uh, no, Jake, kidding. It was about who's your master. 
<laughs> you sure? And Tuesday night was about first love. First love. All right. Do you reckon he did well? Oh, okay. Congratulations. Thank you for watching the live. Okay. Well done. See you tomorrow, Anthony. Okay, everyone. That's us for tonight. Please open your hearts as the word is presented by Pastor Roland. Once again, we're thankful that you're all here tonight and we encourage you to come back again tomorrow. God bless. Good evening, church. Um, it is now time for our prayer bands and we will be doing a continuation of our prayer bands from yesterday, which was led by Sana. And before we start, I want to tell you guys a story, a story about a boy named Michael. Michael had a group of friends and they all sat around at a table and had their lunch and they watched Michael push his food away, close his eyes and say his prayer. They all looked at each other and they were all so confused because why would he want to push his food away from him when he's trying to pray for his food? And so they asked him, Michael, why did you push your food away when you're praying for your food? Michael replied to them, a few years ago, I lost my friend to suicide. And during the, th the funeral, he thought about how the day he died, he prayed more about his food praying about his friend, praying to save his life. And so to this day, Michael prays not for just his food, but for his friends around him as well. And Michael every day lifts up his friends in prayer, not out of guilt or fear, but because prayer is more than just blessing a sandwich. We don't doubt God's blessings on our lives. And if you're like us, we're thankful for everything God gives us. A roof over our heads, a safe place to sleep at night, food on our tables, the clothes we wear, and the cars we ride in. The list goes on and on. The story shared by Lynn really highlights that perhaps we need to change up how we pray, or as highlighted in the story, pray for what might be more beneficial for our relationship with God and others. In John 13, verse 34 to 35, it says a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There are so many people hurting out there. We all have our own struggles and challenges, and I can guarantee that no one here is perfect. We all have our own issues, we all have things that weigh us down, but prayer is a powerful tool and way of life that helps us through these challenges and that's modelled by Jesus himself. Jesus intercedes for us, and that encourages us to intercede for others. By praying to God, we ask him to intervene for others and to help them with whatever they need, whether that be for healing or favour, for an answer, or even for an intervention. By praying for others, we acknowledge that God is the most powerful person in our lives, and we ask him to do for others what we can't do ourselves. In prayer for others, we forget ourselves. And we seek God's best for others. Most importantly for those we don't get along with, even our enemies. So one of the nicest things to say to someone is I'm praying for you. This means that they're interceding for us, pleading for us, and asking for a breakthrough in our life in ways that only God can accomplish. Our theme tonight is breakthrough is easier when you do it with others. And that is so true. Amen, church? We know there is power in numbers, but we also know that there's power in prayer. So tonight, think of someone or even a group uh, they would like God to intervene with in some way. We ask you to stand and link arms with the people next to you to symbolize the power that we have when we pray for one another. As we stand in silence, we ask you to uplift that name or those names to God in prayer. We are going to send a pulse through the church in recognizing the chain reaction and the power that can move when we pray for one another. When the pulse gets to the back, I'll ask the last person in each 
each section to say amen, and then we will finish with the prayer. So can everyone stand up and hold hands, please? start the pulse. Jacinta, you send your pulse down your aisle. Grace, and then Blake, if you can send it down to your section. And then the last people who get the last pulse, which is just a squeeze of a hand, will say amen, and then Grace will finish our prayer. your greatness and providence over all our lives and we simply say thank you thank you and thank you as a church we connect to symbolize as your children who are in need of you in some kind of way we ask for you to guide each of the lives thought and prayed about tonight we know you are all knowing all loving and all present make miracle happen bring healing forgiveness and joy to our lives this is all we ask for, Lord, and your will be done. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. songs, Lord, our, our church has like to ask you all to stand and as we sing our two final songs and when we sing these songs, I just want you to open your hearts and, and just hear the words that um, that will be sung for the next two songs and our first song will be um, one song it's called um, If For My Up.
Just up here to do the welcome. I we just want to. <laughs> we're not serious. I just want to. Um, my welcome partner sort of put the, put me on the spot on uh, Sunday, um, just to just say a little testimony. Yeah, yeah, just about my journey. Um, you know, as a, as a youth leader, not only that, just um, you know, just my. Just my walk in general, eh? And, um, you know, normally if I get put on the spot like this, I'm a bit, like, uh, reluctant to say yes. Um, but um, it's not a, not a boastful thing, a uh, boastful thing. It's not a... Um, uh, like... Um, Yeah, like I'm, I'm really blessed on the journey that, uh, that I'm on. And um, when Brian asked if I could uh, be the youth leader, you know, um, I turned him down. <laughs> I turned him down the first time. And I said, uh, you know what, it's, uh, it's better for the, the younger kids to, to, to be the youth leaders. And um, if you need someone to, you know, help them, you know, in terms of their, um, you know, help them in the, in the committee and stuff, I'll just, you know, I'll just be a part of the committee team. 
And, um, and uh, he said, oh, just pray about it. And, um, you know, uh, a week later, Brian calls me again. And I, should I just hang up? <laughs> should I just hang up on Brian? Or no, So I took the call and, um, you know, it was a God thing. You know, I didn't choose to be a youth leader. God chose me. And, um, you know, the reason why I did take it up after, you know, a week of prayer and just, you know, um, I would say fasting, but I'm lying. Um, but just, a, you know, a sincere prayer, you know, uh, throughout the week. Um, yeah, just Jesus, you know, like um, I've got a good relationship with Roland A. Um, when I moved down to Adelaide and um, sort of, uh, you know, rekindled the, the relationship that we had um, in Jesus, it really helped me just to see um, who I am in Jesus. And um, I guess I just wanted to share that with uh, the youth here. And, um, you know, me growing up in the church here in Mount Jewett, um, you sort of see the generations fade in our church. Um, the older generation is sort of thinning out and the younger kids are sort of, um, you know, sort of doing the same thing. And um, a lot of us, um, you know, sort of life gets in the way we become parents. And, um, you know, we get too busy to come to church. But not, not, not only that, um, we just don't feel like there's a place for us maybe in the church. Um, you know, we feel like we have to do something in the church or be a part of the committee to... To, to serve, but, um, you know, connecting with, um, you know, Roland and, um, you know, a few, of the, a few of the brothers down there who are on a similar journey to where I am, um, there's a lot of emptiness out there. And, um, you know, that's, and I feel... You know, there's a lot of, like Roland keeps on saying, he smashes, you know, social media and that, but all honesty, it takes a part of most of our lives, hey? And, um, you know, I'm guilty as well. And um, so, you know, in terms of uh, taking up the leadership role, it's more knowing, like, uh, just being an example for our kids, just knowing that we can do it together. Like, uh, Jesus didn't want you to go it on your own. You know, Jesus came down to earth and he chose 12, 12 people to, to, to be a community, you know, to do life with. And we've got a, a big congregation here that, you know, to be honest, <laughs> you know, do we even know what you're interested in? Do we know what you're going through? We know the struggles that you're going through. If you do not know the other person next to you, is there something that we're not doing right? You know, I'm not saying that, you know, I know all the answers and stuff. No, I'm not saying that. All I know is that we can do better together. And, um, you know, just reconnecting with Roland again and just seeing him here, um, you know, in all honesty, I probably um, talked to Roland like in the past three years more than some of my family members that live here in Sydney. And that's a, um, it's an awesome thing. It's a sad thing as well because, you know, I'm not doing my part as a Christian, but, you know, I'm not doing my part as a brother. You know, to really, you know, reach out and lend a hand because that's what we're taught to do as Christians, you know. And um, the reason why these areas are like this, because in our journey, in order to grow and become stronger, you need to reach up. You know, and I've shared this with our church in terms of our, um, you know, just um, our, our, our goal for the year, eh, is to really encourage our young people. But we can't do it just by doing this, programs. It really comes down to our relationship with God reaching up. 
And in order for us to be genuine about reaching into our family, we need to reach up. How can we give something? How can we give God if we don't spend time with God? And then when we reach in as a community, so genuine with each other, you know, not being ashamed of whatever you've been through, the scars and the trauma that you've gone through. If we can't be honest with ourselves, how can we be honest with people that we're trying to reach? So our goal for this year, and this is my testimony, you know, despite all the things that I've gone through to get up to this point, I've gotten to this point because, yes, I love Jesus, but I've also got a community around me who loves Jesus that can keep me focused on the goal. So I just want to know, I I just want to let the, the youth know that in order for us to to, 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 to get this breakthrough that we're searching for, that we're looking for. We need our foundation to be Jesus. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I know it all. I'm not saying that, you know, everyone needs to, you know, um, you know reach out to Brian and, and Roland and, and Pastor Sofitu. That will be a start. But if you can't talk to them, like what are we doing as Christians, as brothers and sisters? Why can't you come to one of us? Hey, and that's the barrier we're trying to break here in Mount Jordan, in our church. But it starts with us, hey, it goes back to the red pill. It goes back to the red pill. Are we in the way of blessing other people? Yeah, I just wanna thank you again for this time. But that is my testimony as a youth leader. I didn't choose to be a youth leader. God chose me. song and like for me it's no matter how how far you are um, with your walk with Christ you know you always have setbacks maybe major or minor setbacks you know but when you think of what the Lord has done there's no turning back can I get an amen church and that's pretty much what this what this song is about Lord uh church <laughs> so yeah uh, be with us and be blessed
Amen. Thank you so much, uh, David and the worship team for leading us in worship today. Thank you, Don Sus. Um, just uh, adding a couple of sentences to Donnie's uh, powerful testimony today. I'll probably catch up with Donnie about twice, maybe three times a month. Um, so also, you know, I praise God for those times we catch up. Uh, but honestly, man, um, we catch up two to three times a month. Um, Jesus is connecting with you 24-7. And I just wanted to add that. I know that you implied that. Yeah. And I know that um, I'm so proud of you. So, like I shared on the first night, Donnie, young teenager, 1999, coming up to me, oh, Pastor, you know, I feel impressed to be baptized. And now he's up there, youth leader, sharing the testimony. Uso, the best is yet to come, man. This is just a warm up, man. You've got no idea what God is going to do in you and through you, Uso as well as the whole Mount Druid team. You know, I've been so blessed and inspired by just chatting so many different people. Hey, did you work today? Nah, I took the week off for a week of prayer. So humbled, man. I'm like, wow. You took the week off work? And, and I'm not, if, you, if you're still working, that's good too. We all have different roles to play, but um, I leave here around 10, quarter past 10, sometimes 10.30, praise and worship team. You know, they're here to 11, 11.30 at night, practicing. Um, so, so many people have given blood, sweat, and tears uh, to bless you, but especially to glorify God. And so, um, yeah, again, I just want to give God all the glory. Thank you so much for the master guys leading us in prayer today. That was so powerful. So, so powerful. And I shared in the back room that one of the liars, again, I, I talked about how the devil deceives us at the deepest level. And one of the biggest lies that, that I really hate, and I keep praying every day that Jesus will open our eyes, help us to to see through this lie is the lie that they, the devil's deceived so many Christians into thinking that the faith, faith the owl is the minister in the church. That is wrong. The Bible is clear. Every single follower of Jesus is a minister, is a priest. And that's why I'm so blessed to see these young people, master guys, come here and they were leading us in prayer and worshiping God. Amen? They didn't need to go to Avondale and get a, you know, spend fifty, sixty thousand dollars to get a degree. They were ministers. Tonight, they were ministering to us. Thank you. Thank you, Cousin Chucky, for just leading us in the wonderful icebreaker of dance. And thank you again to the worship team. And so blessed, so blessed. Um, let's pray. Father, we're blessed because of you. We love you so much. Uh, please speak to your wonderful, amazing sons and daughters uh, through this broken vessel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So I just need some help here. Uh, some technical person can come and do this for me. Thank you. Just open it up and start it. Anyway, today's message is uh, people power. <clears throat> people power. Now, I'm not on social media, but my wife, she's on Instagram. And so sometimes she keeps me up to date with some of the things that were happening. And one of the things that really excited me, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, when my wife Jane was telling me that the Mount Drua church was on a health buzz. It was awesome. And I tell you, when I saw your pastor, Pastor Sofitsu, uh, on Sunday, man, he looks amazing. Uh, yeah, put your hands together, Pastor Sofitsu and wife Sarai. Uh, not only that, Pastor Brian and Bo, Bo as well, put your hands together for them. Amen. And I tell you, man, a lot of you guys look different to the way that you looked five years ago when I came, you know? So that's a, in a positive way, in a really, really good way. Praise God for that. And I know I've chatted to some people who said they've sort of fell off the bandwagon. Hey, one of the things that Donnie and I love to say in our group, we have a men's group, I'll share a bit more about it later on, is it's all about progress and not perfection. If you fall off the bandwagon, hey, just get back up, dust yourself off and get back on. Okay, don't give up. Don't give up. But the reason why I love that story is you guys have a real, real life example of what happens when people decide to do something together in community. There's a lot of power when we do things together as a community, as the people of God. Like they say, life is always better together. And it's not an accident. Because if you go right back to Genesis in the beginning, we read in Genesis. So I did it wrong again. <laughs> Sorry, Ula. Get back this way. That's the one. We're suddenly too old for this stuff. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. You'll notice that God says, Let us. He didn't say, Let me. 
Why did he say let us? Because he was talking to the family members within the Godhead. See, the Godhead is a family of three perfect and holy beings. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they live together in perfect, loving, authentic community. So because we are created in the image of God, that means that we too have been created for loving, authentic community. Amen? That's why we thrive in community. And that's why in Genesis chapter 2, after God created everything, he said, looking at Adam, the animals were there, the garden, everything was perfect. Adam had God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And yet God still looked at Adam and said, Oh, you're still there. Something's missing. In English, looking at our guy here, man, it looks like he's hopeless without a lady. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Right in the beginning in creation, God said, it's not good for us to be alone. We're not created to do life on our own. That's why Lone Ranger, I never really got into Lone Ranger when I was a young kid. He was too lonely. He looked, just looked too lonely and miserable. I say, family, it is not good for us to be lonely. And that's one of the, I guess, one of the real big negatives of COVID. You know, so many stories of people in isolation. One of the sad, tragic stories was just the, the rise in suicide rates, not just in Australia, but right across the world, as people were isolated. The loneliness. And we've probably all experienced that horrible feeling of you're in a room like this, full of people, but you're feeling lonely. Maybe even some of us have gone through that worst feeling. You're in a marriage with your wife or with your husband or with your partner, but you're feeling lonely. You know, research shows that it's loneliness. Uh, loneliness is the cause of most divorces. I mean, I know leading up to the divorce, there's a lot of arguing and fighting, but it's the loneliness that the arguing and fighting causes that leads to the divorce. Or the loneliness that, that one person feels when they find out that the other person cheated on them. It's that loneliness. It is not good for us to be lonely. And we remember this for those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s watching those old, old documentaries. And they're still out there, you know. You see the documentary like from Africa. And you see a pride of lions. And they're hunting like maybe a herd of antelope. And then all the lions are like, you know, chasing after the antelopes. And the antelopes are all running together in a herd. They're running together as a group. But then all of a sudden, you know, the herd goes right and one antelope goes left. Oh, you saw that. What do the lions do? They stop chasing the herd and they oh, just get that guy there on his own. That's exactly what the devil does. The devil likes it when you're angry at someone at church. I'm going to stay home. I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm going to stay home six months the devil so look at that guy at home on his own. Look at that girl at home on his own. And man, this hits us guys even worse because one thing I take my hat off to the ladies, you guys do community better, far better than us. You know, us guys, you know, the whole world is falling apart and we can't even open up to our own spouse or our own partner. I remember a few years ago, I lost a good friend to suicide. I was in total shock. And he had friends, he had a, a beautiful family, but we were all in shock and we were just like, man, we had no idea. He looked so happy. One of my other friends was like, man, I just had a barbecue with him last weekend. Everything looked good. We had no idea that the devil had him all alone. All that negative thoughts, whatever it was, and, and somehow the devil deceiving him, helping him to get to a point where he thought, man, the only solution is to end my life. Family, I don't know, this could be a message for someone in the room right now, someone watching online. I want to say, you are never alone. Even if your family is turning their back on you, your church, you are never alone. Because your father is always with you. Doesn't matter what we've done, he will always love you. He will never turn his back on you. That's one reason I love God so much. I don't love God because, you know, one day I was messed up and then I tried really hard. I became perfect and then God started loving me. The reason why I will always love God is even when I was so unfaithful to him, he's always been faithful to me. Always been faithful to me. Even when I cheated on him and I just lied and I did all these things, hurt his sons and daughters, he never gave up on me. And that's why I'm so passionate about God because, man, he never, ever... Gave up on me. He never gives up on you. And that was the story that Donnie was sharing today too. And so we need to discover the truth that John Townian has in his book here. Sorry, that. 
John Townley has this awesome book, really good book. It's called People Fuel. I encourage you to grab it and read a copy. People Fuel. He says this, we are happiest when we know our lives revolve around people. Conversely, we are not ourselves, not our best selves, when we are isolated and alone. He goes on to say the idea is simple. We need to need each other. People are the fuel for us to grow, to be healthy and prosper. God created a system in which we are to need not only him, but also one, an, one another. Amen, family? I so said the key thought I want to share with us tonight is this. Breakthrough is easier when you do it with others. Breakthrough is easier when you do it with others. Anyway, one of the ideas I love in, in John Towner's book, People Fuel, is he says that pretty much you can divide the people in our lives into two groups. We have the gain people and the drain people. And um, what John says, and this is all based on, you know, the latest research, the latest research shows that just as our bodies need physical nutrients from the veggies and the fruits that we eat in order for us to be physically healthy, in order for us to thrive as human beings, we also need relational nutrients from the other human beings in our life in order to be spiritually and emotionally and mentally healthy. And so the gain people, the gain people are the people who, when, when you're around them, they really just fill you with love and joy and peace and positivity. You know, you gain nutrients from them. Those are the gain people. You need to have a lot of gain people in your lives. And then the drain people are the opposites. They're the one, as soon as you see their name come up on the phone, so you just feel the nutrients draining out of you. As soon as you hear their voice, it's Pastor Roland. Oh, sorry, the nutrients are just so <laughs> Have you seen Pastor Roland? Oh, it's still in the day. Again, maybe you're sitting next to a drained person. Don't look at them. Just keep looking forward. Do not look at that drained person if you're sitting next to a drained person. And so, family, I want to share two quick thoughts for you tonight that will help you uh, to, to, to surround yourself with the kind of people that you need. The first thought I want to share with us tonight is this. Do life with your game people. Do life with your game people. You need to surround yourself with people who are positive, people who are spiritual, people who fill your life and your heart uh, with, with the nutrients that you need to thrive and to survive. I love this verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. It says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Amen? Family, you need to do life with your game people. And you know, if you look at the original design that Jesus had for the church, it was, it was designed perfectly for this. You see, when you look in the New Testament and you see the way that Jesus designed the church, Jesus created a two-wing church. It was a church where you had the organized wing, you had the large gathering like the large gathering we're having here tonight. It's really good. And we need to have large gatherings. They're important. But then the church that Jesus started also had what uh, Kel Deval, who's a pastor and a lecturer up at Avondale College, he calls the organic wing. And that's kind of like the small group or the life group or the growth group, whatever you want to call it. And so the church that Jesus started had two wings. It had the organized wing, the large gathering, and then it had the organic wing, the small gathering. In his book, Hero Maker, Dave Ferguson points out that if you look in the New Testament, the stories of Jesus, Jesus spends about 27% of his time in the organized wing. So he's preaching to the, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000. He spent about 27% of his time with the big crowds, but then he spent 73% of his time with a small group, chatting to the disciples on the boat, hanging out with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha at their house, having dinner with his disciples. He spent most of his time in the small group. And so Jesus created this two-wing church. But the problem was, when Constantine, in about 300 AD, uh, 300 AD, made Christianity the religion of the empire, what he did was he brought back the temples and he brought back the priests. And, and, and part of that, one of the results of that was the organic wing sort of got lost to the church. And so church became not we are the church, but church became something that we did when we came to this building that we called churches. And so we lost the organic wing. And the reason why we're really suffering, even today we're suffering for it, is because of this. In order for us to thrive spiritually, we need to be in a missional community. 
What is a missional community? A community, a missional community is a community of people doing life and mission with Jesus. And there's a few reasons for this. Missional communities help us to thrive because one of, one of the challenges, um, I love the way that Pastor Francis Chan puts it. He says this, if you read the Bible, there are 59 one, an, one another statements in the Bible. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another. And he says it's kind of like this. You can give someone all the theory about swimming, but eventually they need to jump into a swimming pool in order to learn how to swim. And then he says it's the same thing for us as Christians. Every weekend when we come to our churches, we hear these messages about we need to love each other, forgive each other, serve one another. But where is the swimming pool that we get to practice this? You see, as amazing and as awesome as these large gatherings are, they're not really good swimming pools for us to practice loving one another and forgiving one another. Why is that? Well, it's kind of like this. If I'm not happy with Donnie and I'm in a big church like this, if Donnie is sitting here, I'm going to go sit way at the back over there. And then if Donnie is trying to, you know, wants to bug me, he knows that's my spot, he comes and sits over there, then I'm going to come and sit way over here. Amen. I know none of us have ever done that. Amen, no. I see Donnie in the corridor. I just quickly turn and go to the toilet, even though I don't want to go to the toilet. <laughs> but if me and Donnie are in a small group together, a life group, maybe it even could be a Sabbath school class. We're in the same Sabbath school class. But let's say, that, um, yeah, let's say, let's say we're in a life group that meets at Donnie's house and we're sitting around the table eating and I'm still not happy with Donnie but he's sitting next to the tomato sauce, and I really love tomato sauce on my food. And I'm like, uh, oh, <clears throat> Donnie, uh, who's getting past the tomato sauce? What do you think the Holy Spirit's going to be saying to my heart? Holy Spirit's going to say, who so? Can't just ask him for tomato sauce. He needs to make up with your brother, amen? And so what happens is because most of us, many Christians, many Adventist Christians, we're not in small groups or life groups or care groups, we, we don't really have to grow in these areas where God really pushes our buttons. Someone, you know, we don't like, you know, you just sit across. But if they keep, you know, if the, if the church building is too small, we just go start another church. What's that? Oh, did you hear that new church plan? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Holy Spirit told us to start a new church. And then you find out the real story later on. Oh, this person had an argument, fight with this outer, <laughs> they're sleeping around. So family, in order for us to thrive, we need to have a community. And you know what, man? The research shows that when people are in community, it breaks us, it just sets us free from consumerism. Again, case in point, okay, if Donnie and I were members of a, a big church and I notice every week I see Donnie coming and he's got holes in his shoes, I'd be like, man, they're poor. So Donnie, I'm going to say a prayer for Donnie. I'm say a prayer for him. Lord, please help that brother Donnie get some new shoes. And, but if Donnie's in my small group, oh, he's solid. I'll be saying, Lord, please help me. And the Holy Spirit say, shh, you buy Donnie some shoes. You go buy them and go deliver it to Donnie's house. You know where he lives. Amen? So family, in order for us to grow, we need to be in close community. But the reason why many of us Christians don't like being in close community is because it's, we like the fact that we can just be fake for a while in this large gathering. Isn't it good? You know, you argue all the way to church and you get here and you're like, oh, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. And your wife is just staring at mm, God is good, whatever. It's like... <laughs> So we like the large gatherings because it's easier for us to fake it. We, we would just get too scary in these small communities because then we've got to start to be real. Then we have to start taking the masks off. But tell me, again, family, I want to say, the reason we're losing so many people to suicide is because they got these masks. They're trying to, man, isn't it awesome? And I've been there. Don't you think it's so much better to be in a place where if you're going through the, the worst time in your life, that you have a group of people that you can just... Take your mask off and say, Usos, man, I'm at breaking point, man. I need some help. Can you come and just hang out with me or something? Isn't that much better than just wearing this mask and then when things get too much, all of a sudden you're just no longer here? In order for us to thrive, family, we need to be in a missional community. I love this diagram, and I know Donnie shared it with you guys too. I love the T-shirts, man, the conquerors on the back. The arrows reach up. Reach in, reach out. That's what it means to be a disciple. You know, I can, I can come to church. You know, we can be church members for 20, 50, 20, however long. But if we're not reaching up, reaching in and reaching out, then we're not really being the full disciples that Jesus wants us to be. 
And I'm not sure if you guys have picked it up, but all my talks are pretty much based on reach out. My first three talks is reach up to God. Why? Because he's God and you're not. Reach up to God. Why? Because it's only in Jesus that you'll find true happiness, not in money and things. Reach up. Why, why should I reach up to God? Because it's not good enough for God to be your number seven love. He needs to be your number one love. My first three talks is all about trying to help you guys to see why reaching up should be a priority in your life. And today I'm talking about reaching in. Why should we reach in? Because when we reach in, we find power in God's family, in God's community, power that we need to thrive and to survive. So a missional community is a group of God's family who are reaching up, reaching in, and reaching out together. Family, and I want to say today that you can take any group. You might be a part of a group now. You can take whatever group you're a part of and turn it into a missional community. Your volleyball team. So at the moment, it's just a place to hang out and, you know, to to get some exercise, hang out with the boys, that's really good. All you need to do to make that a missional community is just add in a little reach up. It doesn't have to be a big one. Just say, hey, boys, what do you think at the, uh, at the end of our games next week? We'll just say a little prayer. What do you guys, just a little reach up. I'm not saying that all of a sudden, you know, the boys are rocking up, doing their warm-up. I say, Usos, I just got a 50-minute sermon, okay? Just, uh, okay, just sit back, I'll share this. <laughs> just a little reach up, just a little, hey, God. Thanks for blessing our game today. So, sorry I lost it and swore at the ref, but just thank you that your grace is... You know, just a little reach up, amen? And then a little reach in. Hey, Usos, where are you sitting? 9.30 after our game? Hey, let's go to Guzman and Gomez. Let's get some burritos. Let's just hang out, reaching in. And then all of a sudden you add a reach out because one of the boys in your team, his next-door neighbor is a solo mum with four kids and, he, and they're struggling financially. And then you go like, hey, Usos, you know how we put in the $7 every night for our fees? And hey, why don't we just maybe once a month, let's chip in $30 each. There's six of us plus a sub, seven times 30, $210. And then once a month, we'll put in that $210. we will go buy a $210 worth of food and we'll go find a, a family that's struggling to give it to them, reaching out. Amen? All of a sudden, we've taken our volleyball team and we've turned it into a missional community, making a difference in the kingdom for Jesus Christ. Or maybe you have a shopping group of your girls. You meet, you know, every Thursday night. So let's go shopping. This is shopping night with the girls. <laughs> and again, there's nothing wrong with shopping with the girls on Thursday night. It's good. You know, go retail therapy. You know, especially if the husband's been a headache all week. Let's just go spend this credit card. Max it out. But then all of a sudden, you know, like, hey, we catch up every Thursday night for shopping. Our girls, I've got this... Um, lady I work with, she's going through a bit of a tough time with, is there a right way to come along? Reaching out. Again, hey, how about, you know, during the week um, on, on Sunday nights, let's just catch up for a little prayer on Zoom or something. Reaching up. And obviously when you're shopping together, you're reaching in, amen? So you can take any group that you have right now. It could be a Sabbath school class, a master guide class, a pathfinder, anything. Right now, that, that's, that's, you know, that's making a difference, making a, a, maybe a small difference, but when you turn it into a missional community, all of a sudden, it just becomes like a, a group of people changing the world for Jesus together. Donnie mentioned that we have a D group. Uh, this was our D group last Wednesday night. And it's, uh, the D stands for doulos, which I mentioned, doulos, uh, Greek word, which means slave, and that was the New Testament apostles and leaders' favorite name for themselves. They call themselves the slaves of Jesus Christ, and they said it with pride which means that whatever Jesus wanted them to do, they would do. And the D also stands for discipleship. Anyway, um, I'm really proud of the youth committee. Uh, so one of the things I've been trying to do for a while is, with the people I work with is just trying to increase our devotional life. And so for a while, we did this thing like maybe try and read one chapter a week. And, and I was really uh, blessed when I was telling you at the beginning of the, the year, and you're saying, oh, our youth committee, yeah, we, we, we really want to start reading the Bible. And, and we decided to do one chapter a day. I was like, one chapter a day, that's awesome, man. Let's put our hands together for the youth committee. Okay. That's it. For those who haven't done the readings yet, just keep smiling and say, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take that as an encouragement. Anyway, with our D group, uh, we, we, we started an app at the beginning of the year. We were reading through the whole Bible. Okay, and it's only four chapters. I don't want to make it seem big. It's only four chapters a day. It takes about 10 to 12 minutes. And again, I just want to also not, not praising Donia. 
but Donnie is my high distinction student in our group. <laughs> and you know how awesome it is? When we were maybe hey, three or four years ago when me and Donnie were in this group and we're doing one chapter a week, Donnie was struggling with one chapter a week. Now he's smashing four chapters a day, amen? And again, it's not about, man, that works. Oh, man, Jesus is going to love me more because I'm reading more Bible. No, the thing I love it is I know that the more time Donnie spends in his word, the more power the Holy Spirit's going to have in his heart and the more he's going to become like Jesus. Is he perfect? No, I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. But by abiding in Jesus, God's going to slowly change him. Anyway, the reason why I wanted to share this, again, I'm talking to every man and also lady if you're alone, is leading up to this week, Sunday night, I'm about to preach, and Jake Feumu, who's in our D group, sends me a text, hey, Uso, just want you to know that I'm praying for you. Man, that was awesome. And then on Monday, driving here, Vai, who's on the photo there, gives me a call. Hey, Pastor Roland, I know you're talking again tonight. I just want to say a prayer for you. Awesome. Pastor Travis there, sharing his New South Wales blues colors after you guys smashed my team, the Maroons. But uh, <laughs> brings me on Monday, also I say a prayer for you. Brings me yesterday, say a prayer for you. Brings me today, say a prayer for you. Man, do you know how awesome and amazing it is to know that, you know, whenever my brother passed away just over a month ago, I just text my D-boys, hey, Usos. Um, brother just passed away. Thank you for the prayers. Please lift me up in prayer and then just see all these, you know, prayer messages come up. Hey, we're so praying for you, man. God bless, much love. Man, that's people power. The, the nutrients that we need to thrive, we get from the people that we surround ourselves with. And say, so family, we need to do life with your game people. And if you don't have any game people in your life, man, I encourage you, ask God to show you tonight, show you some game people that you can surround yourself with that will give you the nutrients, the spiritual nutrients that you need in order to have the breakthrough that God wants for you. The second thought I want to share with you is this. In order to thrive in community, we need to do life with our game people. The second thing is we need to do love with your drain people. Amen. Do love with your drain people. A lot of the drain people that God brings into our lives are in our lives for a reason because they make us more like him. Jesus said this in John chapter 13, 34 to 35. He said, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So in other words, we need to love one another as God loves us. We need to love one another as God loves us. And again, this is only possible when we're abiding in Jesus. This is only possible when we're filled with God's love and God's grace and God's peace. And at the moment, one of the most loving things that we can do as a family for each other is to be peacemakers. Have you noticed how angry people are getting? It seems like we're getting more, ang more and more angry in society today. And again, you know, you've seen those documentaries out there, you know, they just show that, that one of the reasons is is, is um, YouTube and, and all these different social media platforms, you know, and that's not really helping the problem. Like, for instance, you know, if, if I'm like, if I'm pro-vax, and then I start to click on videos that really support, you know, you need to go va vaccinated, you know, then the algorithm will start sending me all these videos that they show me why the anti-vax people are really horrible and, and idiots and that, and why we did, you know. And so it just reinforces this idea, it's like, man, these anti-vax people, you know, da 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 and like, just like the opposite, if I'm an anti-vax person and, and then the algorithm picks up that I like watching videos that support anti-vax, then it starts sending all these videos that show you know why people who are pro-vax, they're Babylon and they're 666, and then again, you start to get angrier and angrier at people who are pro-vax. So we're, we're living in a world where people are just getting angrier. Well, yeah, there's just hate. We just saw it in Samoa, fast versus HRPP, splitting up families, splitting up villages. So one of the most loving things that we can do, let's just go back. What did Jesus say? He said, he didn't say, uh, the size of your Bible will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you have a big Bible, you need to bring a semi-trailer in to bring it to church. People will know, solid, that is a real man of God. Look at his Bible, it's 10 stories tall. No, God didn't say that. Jesus said, it's your love for one another. That will prove to the world that you're really my disciples, amen? Your love for one another. 
I said one of the most loving things that we can do as a family right now to show people that we're really God's followers is to be peacemakers. Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You know, I've been walking with Jesus for 44 of my 50 years. I regret the six years that I didn't walk with Jesus, but I praise him for his blessing upon me those six years. And out of the 44 years that I've been walking with Jesus, I can honestly say that this is the best year ever I've ever had with Jesus Christ. And the reason why is it's because of this thing I'm going to share with you right now. Okay, I know you guys never struggle with this, but I used to struggle. I, I'm the kind of person that I used to get really angry and frustrated and think when, when people sort of don't do what I expect them to do. I know you guys are cool with that. I can't handle it. Anyway, I read this book, Ken Sandy. Um, the book's called Peacemaker, and it changed my life. I read it at the beginning of this year. So Ken Sandy says that there are four stages to conflict. He says the first stage of a conflict is a desire. You have a desire. We see this in James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So the beginning of most conflicts is a desire. And a lot of times it's a good desire. Dad's working hard all day. The man's working hard all day. You know, he comes home. He doesn't expect much. All he wants is the house to be tidy. And yet it's just a uh, mom's nice home-cooked meal, you know. Simple desire. Nothing much. Opens up the door. Oh, he's solid. The house is a mess. Takes a deep breath. All he can smell is baby's smelly nappy that needs to be changed. It's like, solid. Anyway, what happens with that desire when it's not met? Ken Sandy says, if we're not careful, it switches to that next stage. And the next stage is it becomes a demand. So in other words, the husband's now like, shh, what are you doing all day? I'm working hard all day. Can't you even just try and tidy up the house? I just saw you uploaded like 25 TikTok videos. Come on, oh my goodness. <laughs> it becomes a demand. And Ken Sandy says this, when we slip into that stage of demand, he says, the more we want something, the more we think we need and deserve it. So the husband's like, man, this is not just something I need. I actually deserve it, man. I'm working hard. She needs to do this. I deserve it. And the more we think we are entitled to something, the more convinced we are that we cannot be happy and secure without it. So all of a sudden now, the only thing that we need in order to have a perfect life is just for our wife to clean the house and to cook me some nice food for dinner. He goes on to say this, when we see something has been essential to our fulfillment and well-being, it moves from being a desire to a demand. I wish I could have this evolves into I must have this. This is where trouble sets in. Even if the initial desire was not inherently wrong, it has grown so strong that it begins to control our thoughts and behavior. In biblical terms, it has become an idol. That was one sentence that changed my life. See, um, I have a lot of desires, and when people, whether it's family members or church members, you know, they, my desire is this, and they do something else. And it frustrates me, and it's just, oh, man, I'm just like, sorry, they didn't know. But in all that time, I never ever saw my frustration or my, 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 you know, my, my, my anger and not getting what I desired meant. I never ever saw it as an idol. It was that one sentence that changed my life. Because I'll give you an example. There's the same, same reason. But maybe one of the examples of the things that used to bug me heaps until I read this at the beginning of the year was millennials. My, um, Jesus loves millennials. Amen. I love millennials. But there was one thing that, you know, not the millennials in Sydney, it's the millennials in Adelaide. <laughs> one thing that used to frustrate me is if I message a millennial and they don't reply back. And then I call them and I leave a message and I still don't get it. Not even a thumbs up or in a, not even a smiley face. I think millennials call it ghosting or something like that. <laughs> ghosting brings out the sakangi in me big time, man. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, help me. I say, it's to frustrate me so much. I'll call, leave messages, text, nothing, nothing coming back. My generation, okay, if you call me, I will call you back. 
If you text me, I'll text you back. Sometimes I forget, and I might text you back the next day. Hey, we're so really sorry. Got busy yesterday. Forgot to. So I, I don't quite understand. Maybe different generations. I, I don't understand like this new generation. So I don't. I sound very judgmental. Eh? Sorry. I, I don't understand where people think it's okay to get like two phone messages and three text messages and to feel oh, that's okay. I don't really have to reply back to to Roland. It's all good. I'm sure he's happy. You know, he's a Christian. Maybe it's the way that millennials show love. You know, hey, pastor, I love you. That, I show you my love for you by ghosting you. That's, that's how you know I love you heaps. You know. <laughs> and so what happened was this desire to get a, a thumbs up or something, just some sort of response from the millennials I left messages with, became an idol. It was almost as if I reached the point in my life like, man, my life would be perfect. My life would be amazing if only these millennials, you know what I mean? I'd made it an idol. I was, I was expecting this response to my text in order for me to be happy and to have peace. But you know what, family? What, what does the Bible say? Only Jesus can give us true love, joy, and peace. Amen? So, husband, even if you go home and, you, and the house is messy every day and you never, ever get a home-cooked meal, you can still have love, joy, and peace because you have Jesus. Can I hear an amen out there, church? Lady, you know, even if your husband, you know, he stays at home playing video games all day, he's been unemployed for 20 years. <laughs> and it's been driving you crazy. Now you realize, hey, even if my husband never gets a job, it doesn't matter. He will never take my peace because my peace is in Jesus. Amen? Even for me, like I said, this is my best year ever with Jesus. Even if my millennial brothers and sisters whom I love so much with all my heart, even if they never give me a little thumbs up, I know it takes five hours to do a thumbs up. It's very difficult. Even if they never do that, I'm happy. Why? Because I have Jesus. My love, my joy, my peace is not based on fulfilling my desires anymore. It's based on my relationship with Jesus. This has transformed my walk with Jesus. I'm so much happier. Just ask my wife, Jane. She should tell you the stories. Because Jesus says this, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus says, I give you peace. Jesus didn't say, hey, you know, if you really want to have peace, you need to make sure that your husband does everything you want or your wife does. No, no, he says, hey, if you want peace, come to me and I'll give you peace. I will give you peace. No matter what situation you're in, I will give you peace. So again, friends, the good news, I'm not sure what burden you carried in here today. You can leave today with peace not because the situation has changed, but you can leave here with peace because you'll, you'll be leaving with Jesus. <laughs> leaving with joy because you will have Jesus. So in other words, as Jesus followers, we don't work for peace. We work from peace. So when Jesus is living in our hearts, you know, we're not striving and trying to get people to do this so that we can have peace. No, Jesus is living in our hearts. Now he's filling us with his love, his joy, and his peace. So we work from peace. We don't work for love. We work from love. We don't work for joy, we work from joy. And because of that, God enables us to make a difference and to help bring healing into all the angry people and relationships that are out there. Anyway, the third step is if the demand is not met, so the husband's like, man, I've had it. It's just over this, man. This woman is useless. He gets, uh, the man starts to judge, or the woman too. This lady's useless. Why can't she be like my, my friends? You know, my friend every day gets a nice, you know, cut meal with his fruits, nice cut in a little container. Why can't she do that? And then after the third stage, we go to the last stage. And the last stage is punish. When the man's like, oh, man, I've had it, man. My boss, their secretary, has been making funny eyes at me. <laughs> if my wife doesn't want to make my lunch, tidy my house, I'm going to go and see where this leads me, amen? Amen. Family, I just want to ask you, what could you be doing right now to try and punish someone because they're not meeting a desire that you want them to? I've done this many times. In the early years of my marriage, the thing I used to do to punish Jane was I wouldn't talk to her. They call it stonewalling. So when I was angry at Jane, I wouldn't talk to her for like one, two, three, five, seven days. Sometimes I should be angry, like, please tell me. I said, nothing. Nothing. Are we doing something at the moment to try and punish someone because they're not meeting a desire? 
Anyway, as I reflect on this and as I reflect on Jesus, I see that we are so different to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus also had a desire, amen? And Jesus' desire was for us to be in perfect relationship with him for all eternity. But sin separated us from God and it destroyed God's desire. But the thing I love about Jesus is although he had his demand and he judged us and then he punished us, but the awesome thing about Jesus was then Jesus stepped up and he said, hey, I want to take this punishment on myself. We read in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4. It says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus had a desire. We didn't meet it. Jesus had a demand. We didn't meet it. Jesus judged us and we were judged guilty. The wages of sin is death. But then Jesus said, hey, I want to come and take the punishment of your sins on myself, amen? So family, if you want to have breakthrough in your life, you need to do life with your game people and you need to do love with your dream people. Breakthrough is easier when you do it with others, amen? And that's why we all need a church family to be a part of. When we're baptized, you know, baptism is not just a symbol of being baptized into the family of God. Uh, when you get baptized, you're also baptized into the body of Christ. And I mentioned that on Saturday, you know, there's a plan, but it's not like a concrete plan. We go with the Spirit. So Pastor Brian, Pastor Sufitu, uh, Donnie and the youth team, they prepare stuff in case there is someone who just feels the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you know what? It's time for you to step up and just cross that line and be baptized. And when I say that when you step up and cross that line to be baptized, it's not a graduation. That's just the beginning of your journey. Baptism is a birth. I already shared it on Sunday night and I've re-emphasized it over the last couple of nights. The only two things you need in order to be baptized is to believe in Jesus and to love Jesus. And I shared on, what was it, last night? Yeah, I shared last night. Even if Jesus is not your number one love, God will take that. He'll take that because you'll know that he can work with that. So maybe you come up to, you know, to get baptized tomorrow and you're still, you know, still in a relationship that's not up to God's standards. But God's like, hey, bring it. Come, bring your relationship to me. And then I'll take you to levels way beyond even what you can imagine and dream. Amen. And say, so family, um, at the end of tonight's talk, just putting it out there, at the end of tonight's talk, if you feel the Holy Spirit say to you, hey, it's time to cross that line, you will never, ever be good enough to be baptized. That's why I had to die on the cross for you. And you will never, ever know enough. It's not like you don't have to sit an exam in order to be baptized. You know in your heart that you believe in me. And you know that over the, you know, the last few nights and even before the nights, before this thing started, you know that deep in your heart you already love me. So what else is stopping you? And family, let me put it to you this way. Okay, you might not realize this, but the thing is, if you, um, if the only thing that's holding you back from being baptized is you think you're not good enough and you think you don't know enough, do you know what you're doing? The younger people watching you are going to follow your example too. And that's why sometimes when you grow up an example, I grew up in a very legalistic church. The, I'm not saying Mount Druid Church is not a legalistic church. Man, just the worship we had today tells me that Mount Druid is a church filled with God's love and grace. Thank you to all our mums and dads. Let's give our parents a big clap. Thank you for your love and grace. But I grew up in a very legalistic church. And so what happened when I was 15 and then 20 when I hit my lowest point? At that time, because all I believed as a kid was that God only loves you if you're good. And because I, I believed with all my heart that God only loved me if I was good and I wasn't good, that's what led me to almost ending my life at 20. But then by God's grace, God's Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you know, like I said, it wasn't an audible voice, but God spoke to me and said, 
hey, don't do this. I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. I still love you. I'm still with you. I say, family, because I know what it's like. So, like, oh man, I really want to get baptized. I really want to talk to Pastor Brian after this. But man, I'm still smoking. And man, I don't want people in the church saying, oh, so late, I got baptized. Yeah, yeah, he's still smoking cigarettes. Did you see him smoking in the back? Like I already told you, family, five years ago, Satan did not get kicked out of heaven for smoking. He got kicked out of heaven for gossiping and dissension, for being jealous and envious. So God hates jealousy way more than smoking. What? Just goes in your case out. Yeah, that's all. But gossip wrecks relationships. Gossip destroys churches. Amen? Breakthrough is easier when you do it with others. Satan will lie to you, deceive you, to keep you away from the family that you need to thrive and grow. Satan will tell you that you're not good enough, that you don't know enough, that you're not worthy. Family, let me just say this. Why would you let someone who hates your guts, why would you let someone who hates God run your life and make the decisions for you? Does that make sense? Someone that absolutely hates you wants to destroy you and you're like, so what do you think I should do, Satan? Doesn't make sense at all, family. The only person you can trust is not me. You are, I'm broken. The only person you can trust is Jesus Christ. And so if Jesus is putting it on your heart, hey son, hey daughter, just like Donnie, you know, he, was, he wasn't quite ready for the testimony, but he did an awesome job. I know you weren't ready for the baptism this week, but I actually prepared this baptism for you. This baptism's for you. This whole week was for you. So that you can cross that line. Not because you're worthy, but because I died for you on the cross. Not because you earned it, but because I earned it by giving my life. And then I was buried, but death couldn't hold me in the grave. I came back to life again. So that you can have that eternal relationship with me. Yeah, and if people are going to gossip, you know what? When are you going to stop listening to people and start listening to me? When are you going to stop caring about what they say and start caring about what I say? And what I think and what I believe about you. Family breakthrough is easier when you do it with others. Mount Drew, it's an awesome, amazing church family you can be a part of. You might have a gift or a talent that this church family needs. Or maybe God's calling you to be a part of another church. That's awesome. We're all part of the same body, the same body of Jesus. Amen. So God's calling you to make that step. At the end of worship, um, you know, the pastors, the leaders will hang out at the front. Just come and chat to us, even if you just want to ask them some, some questions. We'll be waiting here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We're just going to head into our final song. We ask that you stand with us. This is our theme song. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that now, so we ask that you sing along with us. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Carrying there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is love Break every strong
praise you for the love, the healing, the power, the life that we find in your name. And Father, I just want to say a special prayer. I didn't even have to pray because I know that you're praying. For maybe someone who's uh, bowed before you right now and you're whispering to their hearts and you're calling them, hey, come forward, come forward, talk to the pastor today. This baptism is for you. You say, Father, if you are talking to someone in this room today, I just pray, Father, that they will just shut out the noise from family, friends, even my voice. I just pray you help them to hear your voice, that you will give them the courage and the boldness that they need to make the best decision ever of stepping across that line and surrendering their hearts to you. Making that statement, hey, man, I've tried being God. It's not working out for me. I'm going to try the real God, Jesus Christ. 
I've tried, you know, loving other things more than I love God. Again, man, my life is just falling apart. I want to make Jesus my first love. Lord, help them, we pray in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you also not only that you died on the cross for us, you saved us, you give us so many spiritual blessings. Thank you for loving family. You prepared a wonderful uh, meal for us to share, uh, to share and to enjoy in the room next door. Please bless those who made that meal. Help us to have a wonderful time of fellowship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, family. Thank you.